perhaps 70% of the Tutsis in Rwanda. It is a crime that is not applied by the tribunal to the former Yugoslavia for the displacement of approximately one million residents of Kosovo in 1999. Neither was it applied by that tribunal nor by this court when deciding upon the exodus of the Serb population from Croatia in 1995. In both situations, international justice resisted the temptation to use this strongest of legal classifications because the requisite specific intent to physically destroy the targeted group in whole or in part was not present. Regrettably, the Gambia has placed before the court an incomplete and misleading factual picture of the situation in Rakhine State in Myanmar. Yet, it is of the utmost importance that the court assess the situation obtaining on the ground in Rakhine dispassionately and accurately. The situation in Rakhine is complex and not easy to fathom. But one thing surely touches all of us equally, the sufferings of the many innocent people whose lives were torn apart as a consequence of the armed conflicts of 2016 and 2017, in particular, those who have had to flee their homes and are now living in camps in Cox's Bazaar. Mr. President and members of the court, the troubles of Rakhine State and its population, whatever the background, go back into past centuries and have been particularly severe over the past few years. Currently, an internal armed conflict is going on there between the Arakan army, an organized Buddhist armed group with more than 5,000 fight, 5, fighters and the regular Myanmar Defense Services. None of the speakers yesterday made any reference to this. The Arakan army seeks autonomy or independence for Rakhine, or Arakan, as it was called, finding inspiration in the memory of the security restrictions such as curfew and checkpoints are in place at present in the conflict zone and affect the situation of civilians regardless of their background. Mr. President, on 9th October 2016, approximately 400 fighters of the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, known as ARSA, launched simultaneous attacks on three police posts in Moundor and Rathedown townships in northern Rakhine, near the border with Bangladesh. Aosa claims responsibility for these attacks, which led to the death of nine police officers, more than 100 dead or missing civilians, and the theft of 68 guns and more than 10,000 rounds of ammunition. This was the start of an internal armed conflict between Aosa and Myanmar's def defense services, which lasted until late 2017. The selective factual propositions contained in the Gambia's application actually concern this conflict. In the months following the 9th October 2016 attacks, AUSA grew in strength in the Moundor, Budidao, and Rathaydown townships in northern Rakhine. It resorted to threats and intimidation against local villagers in order to gain support and allegiance, executing suspected informers. According to, among others, the International Crisis Group, AUSA received weapons and explosives training from Afghan and Pakistani militants. militants. In the early morning of 25th August 2017, several thousand AUSA fighters launched coordinated attacks on police posts and villages and an army base in North Rakhine. Most of the attacks took place on the narrow Moundor Plain which is framed by densely forested hills to the east and the border with Bangladesh to the west. Indications are that Aosa's objective was to seize Moundor Township. It may aid the court to briefly consider the historical significance of Moundor. When Britain made Burma a colonial entity separate from British Burma in 1937, the border between Burma and India was drawn along the river Naf, where we find today's border between Bangladesh and Myanmar. The historical kingdom of Arakan had at times 
extended much further to the north than the River Naf, including most of what is today Chittagong District in Bangladesh. Members of some Rakhine communities therefore felt that the border drawn by the British was too far south, others that it was too far north. Myanmar has never challenged this border since independence in 1948. Britain did not lose control over what is today Maunda Township during World War II. From September 1942, a number of local Muslim families offered fighters to the British irregular V4 set up to collect intelligence and initially absorb any Japanese advance. Many Muslim gave, Muslims gave their lives in combat against the Japanese in Rakhine. The sacrifices made by Muslim fighters motivated a call for the creation of an autonomous Muslim space in northern Rakhine centered on Mando. Whether or not this was encouraged by British officers, Britain rejected this call as soon as it had reoccupied Burma before independence in 1948. The Muslim Buddhist intercommunal violence of 1942 recurred in 1948 and several times after that. This cycle of violence has negatively affected life in northern Rakhine, making it the second poorest state in Myanmar. Mr. President and members of the court, may I go back to the situation in Rakhine on the morning of 25th August 2017. More than 30 police stations and villages and one military base had been attacked before sunrise in a highly coordinated fashion by an organized armed group operating along a densely forested hill range that provides ample op opportunity for hiding. Many of the Arsa fighters had been recruited from local villages in the weeks and months preceding the attack. Myanmar's defense services responded to the attacks of Arsa fighters by the use of ground forces. There were armed incidents in more than 60 locations. The main clashes occurred in 12 places, in Minji, Dolatoli village, Chapdian village, Maunu village, Gutabian village, Aletanjo village, Mienla village, Indian village, Chengkali or Kodangap village, Myodaji ward, Jaupandu village, wards of Maundo town and southern Maundo. Mr. President, please allow me to clarify the use of the term clearance operation, name ye shen ye in Myanmar. Its meaning has been distorted. As early as the 1950s, this term has been used during military operations against the Burma Communist Party in Bogo Range. Since then, the military has used this expression in counterinsurgency and counterterrorism operations after attacks by insurgents or terrorists. In the Myanmar language, Nemye Shenye literally means clearing of locality simply means to clear an area of insurgents or terrorists. It is still not easy to establish clear patterns of events in these 12 locations. Many Arsa fighters died. There may have been several hundred casualties in some of the 12 locations. There was some intercommunal violence. Buddhist and Hindu minority communities also feared for their security after the original Arsa attacks, and many fled from their homes. It may be worth noting that the use of air power in military operations was avoided as far as possible to minimize the risk of collateral damage. However, in one incident, in order to extract a unit surrounded by hundreds of Arsa fighters, the use of a helicopter was required. There was shooting from the helicopter, which resulted in fatalities, which may have included non-combatants. Mr. President, it cannot be ruled out that disproportionate force was used by members of the defense services, in some cases, in disregard of international humanitarian law, or that they did not distinguish clearly enough between our fighters and civilians. There may also have been failures to prevent civilians from looting or destroying property after fighting or in abandoned villages. But these are determinations to be made in the due course of the criminal justice process, not by any individual in the Myanmar government. 
Please bear in mind this complex situation and the challenge to sovereignty and security in our country when you are assessing the intent of those who attempted to deal with the rebellion. Surely, under the circumstances, genocidal intent cannot be the only hypothesis. Under its 2008 constitution, Myanmar has a military justice system. Criminal cases against soldiers or officers for possible war crimes committed in Rakhine must be investigated and prosecuted by that system. On 25th November 2019, the Office of the Judge Advocate General announced the start of a court martial for allegations linked to the Gudapian village incident, one of the 12 main incidents referred to earlier. The Office also let it be known that there will be additional courts martial if further incriminating evidence is brought up by the Independent Commission of Inquiry. The ICOE is an independent special investigation procedure established for Rakhine allegations by the President of Myanmar, chaired by a former Deputy Minister from the Philippines with three other members, including a former Under Secretary General of the United Nations from Japan. On 26 November 2019, this commission announced that it had taken about 1,500 witness statements from all affected groups in Rakhine and that it has interviewed 29 military personnel who were deployed to the affected, ta affected townships in northern Rakhine during the military operations from 25th August 2017 to 5th September 2017, as well as 20 police personnel who were stationed at the police posts that were attacked on 25th August 2017. There is currently no other fact-finding body in the world that has garnered relevant first-hand information on what occurred in Rakhine in 2017 to the same extent as the Independent Commission of Inquiry and the Office of the Judge Advocate General in Myanmar. This fact reinforces my sense that I should refrain from any action or statement that could undermine the integrity of these ongoing criminal justice processes in Myanmar. They must be allowed to run their course. It is never easy for armed forces to recognize self-interest in accountability for their members and to implement a will to accountability through actual investigations and prosecutions. I respectfully invite the members of the court to consider for the moment the record of other countries. This is a common challenge even in resource-rich countries. Recent cases in the, news, in the news headlines illustrate that even when military justice works, there can be reversals. This can also happen in Myanmar. As part of the overall efforts of the Myanmar government to provide justice, a court martial found that 10 Muslim men had been summarily executed in Indian village, one of the 12 locations of serious incidents referred to earlier. It sentenced four officers and three soldiers, each to 10 years in prison with hard labor. After serving a part of the sentences, they were given a military pardon. Many of us in Myanmar were unhappy with this pardon. Other cases are undertaken without controversy. For example, in the Mansi case, a court-martial sat close to the location in Kachin State where three internally displaced civilians had been killed. It sentenced six soldiers, each to 10 years in prison, in January 2018. Relatives of the victims and local civil society representatives were invited to the proceedings. The Office of the Judge Advocate General in Myanmar is by our standards well-resourced with more than 90 staff and a presence in all regional commands throughout the country. I'm encouraged by the Gutabiem Court Martial and I expect the office to continue its investigations and prosecutions based on reliable evidence gathered in Rakhine and from persons who witnessed what happened there. Can there be genocidal intent on the part of a state that actively investigates, prosecutes, and punishes soldiers and officers 
who are accused of wrongdoing. Although the focus here is on members of the military, I can assure you that appropriate action will also be taken against civilian offenders in line with due process. There will be no tolerance of human rights violations in the Rakhine or elsewhere in Myanmar. Mr. President, there are, those, there, there are those who wish to externalize accountability for alleged war crimes committed in Rakhine almost automatically without proper reflection. Some of the United Nations human rights mandates relied upon in the application presented by the Gambia have even suggested that there cannot be accountability through Myanmar's military justice system. This not only contradicts Article 20B of the Constitution of Myanmar, it undercuts painstaking domestic efforts relevant to the establishing of cooperation between the military and the civilian government in Myanmar in the context of a constitution that needs to be amended to complete the process of democratization. That process is now underway at the Pidanzu Luto, the Union Parliament. The emerging system of international criminal justice rests on the principle of complementarity. Accountability through domestic criminal justice is the norm. Only if domestic accountability fails may international justice come into play. It would be inconsistent with complementarity to require that domestic criminal justice should proceed much faster than international criminal justice. A rush to, ex a rush to externalize accountability may undermine professionals in domestic criminal justice agencies. What does the appearance between domestic and international accountability do to the public's trust in the intentions of impatient international actors? No stone should be left unturned to make domestic accountability work. It would not be helpful for the international legal, or legal order if the impression takes hold that only resource-rich countries can conduct adequate domestic investigations and prosecutions, and that the domestic justice of countries still trust striving to cope with the burden of unhappy legacies and present challenges cannot be made good enough. The Gambia will also understand this challenge with which they too are confronted. Mr. President and members of the court, these reflections are relevant to the present hearing because the applicant has brought a case based on the Genocide Convention. We are, however, dealing with an internal armed conflict started by coordinated and comprehensive attacks by the Arakan Rohingya Salvation, Salvation Army, ARSA, to which Myanmar's defense services responded. Tragically, this armed conflict led to the exodus of several hundred thousand Muslims from the three northernmost townships of Rakhine into Bangladesh, just as the armed conflict in Croatia, with which the court had to deal, led to the massive exodus of, first, ethnic Croats, Croats and later, ethnic Serbs. As I've already stated, if war crimes have been committed by members of Myanmar's defense services, they will be prosecuted through our military justice system in accordance with Myanmar's constitution. It is a matter for the competent criminal justice authorities to assess whether, for example, there had been inadequate distinction between civilians and ARSA fighters, disproportionate use of force, violations of human rights, failure to prevent plundering of property or destruction, or acts of forcible displacement of civilians. Such conduct, if proven, could be relevant under international humanitarian law or human rights conventions, but not under the 1948 Genocide Convention for reasons on which Professor William Shabers will elaborate in a moment. Mr. President, allow me to share one further reflection in this great hall of justice. International law may well be our, only, be our only global value system and international justice a practice 
that affirms our common values. Leaders of relevant intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations should also be cognizant of their responsibility to express and affirm fundamental values. Feeding the flames of an extreme polarization in the context of Rakhine, for example, can harm the values of peace and harmony in Myanmar. Aggravating the wounds of conflict can undermine unity in Rakhine. Hate narratives are not simply confined to hate speech. Language that contributes to extreme polarization also amounts to hate, narrative, to hate narratives. Several international actors face a challenge here. But Myanmar also could have done more since the 1980s to emphasize the shared heritage and deeper lay among the diverse peoples of our country. Cycles of intercommunal violence in Rakhine, going back to the 1940s, should be countered not just by practical measures aimed at sustainable development and rule of law, but also by nourishing a spiritual mindset of unity. It is a moral responsibility of leaders to guard the aspirations of people for harmony and peace. Utant, the third United Nations Secretary General, had understood this. He wrote in his memoirs, View from the UN, published in 1974, I even believe that the mark of the truly educated and imaginative person facing the 21st century is that he feels himself to be a planetary citizen. Encouraging this added layer of identity, a sense of planetary citizenship, is of fundamental importance for peaceful relations between nations, as well as between ethnic and religious groups. A commitment to broadening the mindset must go hand in hand with practical steps to improve lives. Even before the events of 2016 to 2017, Muslim, Buddhist, and other communities in Rakhine faced what the Kofi Annan Advisory Commission described as complex challenges of low development and poverty rooted in enduring social conflict between the communities. The Myanmar government is committed to addressing these challenges. Together with our partners, we are now striving to ensure that all communities enjoy the same fundamental rights. To expedite citizenship verification and application, a mobile team is already in operation. All children born in Rakhine, regardless of religious background, are issued with birth certificates. Arrangements have been made to enable more youth, Muslim youth to attend classes at universities across Myanmar. With the support of international and local partners, scholarships will also be made available to students from all communities living in Rakhine. The government has started a social cohesion model project in Moundor Township to promote social harmony among all communities. Interfaith fora have been encouraged. These are some of the steps taken to improve livelihoods, security, access to education and health, citizenship, and social cohesion for all communities in Rakhine. Three IDP camps have already been closed, and an IDP camp closure strategy has been adopted. Myanmar is also to the voluntary, safe, and dignified repatriation of displaced persons from Rakhine under the framework agreement reached between Bangladesh and Myanmar. Mr. President, how can there be an ongoing genocide or genocidal intent when these concrete steps are being taken in Rakhine. To conclude, Mr. President and members of the court, Rakhine today suffers an internal armed conflict between the Buddhist Arakan army and Myanmar's defense services. Muslims are not a party to this conflict, but may, like other civilians in the conflict area, be affected by security measures that are in place. We pray the court to refrain from taking any action that might aggravate the ongoing conflict, and armed conflict, and peace and security in Rakhine. Right now, in northern Rakhine, an army base 
near Palewa is under attack by a group of more than 400 Arakan army fighters, and some 200 insurgents have surrounded a military column near An City in Rakhine. Since Myanmar gained independence in 1948, our people have not known the security of sustainable development that is a fruit of peace and prosperity. Our greatest challenge is to address the roots of distrust and fear, prejudice and hate that undermine the foundations of our union. We shall adhere steadfastly to our commitment <coughs> to nonviolence, human rights, national reconciliation, and rule of law as we go forward to build the democratic federal union to which our people have aspired for generations past. We look to justice as a champion of the reconciliation and harmony that will assure the security and rights of all peoples. Mr. President and members of the court, I thank you for your kind attention and I ask that you now call upon Professor William Shabers to continue the Myanmar submissions. I thank the agent of Myanmar for her statement. I now invite Professor Shabas to take the floor. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, it's an honor to appear before the court today. Our hearing today does not concern the merits of the claim that the Gambia seeks to bring. It is confined to whether the court should indicate provisional measures. It's established, it's established case law that certain preconditions must be met if the court is to do so. My presentation will focus on the requirement of a plausible I will be followed by Mr. Starker, Star Staker, who will speak to the requirements of prima facie jurisdiction and standing, and then by Ms. Okawa, who will complete our first round of observations by addressing the lack of real and imminent risk of irreparable prejudice to the rights in dispute. The Gambia seems to accept the plausibility test developed in the court's jurisprudence, but has misunderstood the standard applied by the court. The plausibility requirement is a necessary corollary of the mandatory nature of the court's provisional measures. For this reason, the references to provisional measures orders in 1993 may not be as helpful to the court as the Gambia suggested yesterday, given that they were adopted well prior to the court's important ruling on binding provisional measures in the Lagrand case. The Gambia claims that the rights it alleges are plausible, alleges are plausible provided they are based on a mere, and I quote, possible interpretation of the convention. Mr. President, twice in the past 12 years, this court issued judgments on the application of the Genocide Convention. It has examined in excruciating detail both the material and the psychological elements of the crime applying well-accepted principles of interpretation, studying the travaux préparatoires, and showing due deference for specialized bodies like the International Criminal Tribunals for Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia. Interpretations of the convention that may have been plausible in 2006, before the judgment in Bosnia and Herzegovina versus Serbia, have ceased to be plausible since then. And if there was any doubt, the court's judgment in Croatia versus Serbia in 2015 resoundingly confirmed what it had said in 2007. Yesterday, counsel for the applicant avoided discussing the impact of these recent judgments. There were several references to the 1951 advisory opinion, but apparently none to the 2015 judgment. In discussing the interpretation of Article 2 of the 1948 Convention, rather than turn to the court's recent pronouncements, counsel cited Raphael Lemkin's famous book published in 1944. In the sentence that was cited, Lemkin said that the focus of genocide was not on, quote, the immediate destruction of a group, 
but rather with destruction of the essential foundations of the life of national groups. Alas, Lemkin's original vision, which had much in common with our modern conception of crimes against humanity, did not prevail in the General Assembly in 1948 when the convention was adopted. The drafters of the convention settled on a much narrower view of the scope of genocide than Lemkin had contemplated in, contemplated in his book, and one that has since been confirmed in the case law of this court. It was only on the basis of this action of the crime of genocide that states were willing to accept and undertake significant obligations, including the compromissory clause. Indeed, more than 70 years later, they still hesitate to adopt a comprehensive equivalent convention dealing with crimes against humanity, despite noble efforts of the International Law Commission. Here we are, four years after Croatia versus Serbia, and the court is being asked to indicate provisional measures based upon allegations that simply cannot meet the terms of the convention as authoritatively interpreted by the court. In Croatia versus Serbia, the court described a distinction between ethnic cleansing and genocide, with the former implying displacement and the latter referring to destruction as, and I've highlighted the words on the screen, solidly rooted in its jurisprudence. The authority of that judgment is surely enhanced by the size of the majority, 15 to 2. In Bosnia, the majorities var varied for each paragraph of the positive, were between 11 and 14. Unless the court were now suddenly and abruptly to abandon its jurisprudence constante, the Gambia, based upon the facts alleged in the application, does not have a plausible case, a case with any possibility of success. Members of the court may recall that in the Croatia versus Serbia case, Croatia invited the court to reinterpret the convention provisions. You were told, and I quote counsel for Croatia, that, and I quote, the law has moved on over the past seven years. The quotation is on the screen. If this case ever gets to the merits stage, I expect you, I expect you will hear similar statements proposing once again a break with your established case law. Is this plausible? That any claim before the court that is inconsistent with established case law is plausible because, to return to the phrase in the application, it consists of a possible interpretation of the Genocide Convention. Can a challenge to something that is solidly rooted, those are the words of the court, in its jurisprudence have a plausible chance of success. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, the plausibility criterion first appeared in the case law of the court a decade ago in Belgium versus Senegal, a case involving no evidentiary issues. Subsequently, Judge Greenwood wrote that the court might just as well have opted for the term arguable, more widely used in common law jurisdictions. He said, and I quote, Unless there is a reasonable prospect that a party will succeed in establishing that it has the right which it claims and that the right is applicable to the case, then it cannot be said that the right might be adjudged to belong to it. Over the years, of course, the court has become more demanding. In recent Rejecting a request for provisional measures under the International Convention for the Suppression of the Financing of Terrorism, the court stressed that the applicant had to, quote, afford a sufficient basis to find it plausible, and that the constitutive elements of knowledge and intention required by the convention were present. The court found that there was no sufficient evidentiary basis to find it plausible that such elements of intention and knowledge were indeed present. The rejection of provisional measures in Ukraine versus Russia is especially pertinent because it involved a treaty of international criminal law, a cousin of the Genocide Convention, as it were. 
Subjective intent and knowledge are, of course, also requirements of the Genocide Convention. Thus, for the purposes of provisional measures, a plausible claim under the Genocide Convention must include evidence of the required specific genocidal intent. For it is this subjective intent that is the critical element distinguishing genocide from other violations of international law, such as crimes against humanity and war crimes, for which, in this case, the court obviously lacks jurisdiction. Furthermore, Mr. President, Your Excellencies, in assessing whether the required level of plausibility is met in relation to both legal and factual matters, the court should also take into account the gravity of the alleged violations. The court's well-established approach at the merit stage is that the graver the charge, the more confidence must there be in the evidence relied on. This principle must apply mutatis mutandis at the provisional measures phase, which may also result in a binding applicant unable to fully develop its own evidentiary base. In a case like this, involving allegations of exceptional gravity, a corresponding ability standard should be applied already at this phase of the proceedings. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, in Bosnia and Herzegovina versus Serbia and Croatia versus Serbia, the court did not have much difficulty concluding that some of the underlying acts listed in the paragraphs of Article II of the Genocide Convention had been established. I do not propose to consume any time here this morning arguing about this point. Let us assume, without, without making any admission for me and Mara, that a plausible case can be made for the application of at least one of the paragraphs of Article II of the Convention. Much time was consumed at yesterday's hearing with the recital of what we can all read in the reports of the fact-finding mission, and this despite your reminder, Mr. President, of Practice Direction 11. The hard part, and it was on this that both the applications and the counterclaim floundered in the two genocide cases decided recently by this court, is the mental element. And on this point, the applicant has had little to say other than the mistaken assumption that a pattern of conduct is enough to constitute a plausible claim. The United Nations fact-finding mission, upon which the application relies so heavily, frequently refers to the inference of genocidal intent. The theory seems to be that certain types of act, taken individually or as a whole, tip the balance in favor of a conclusion that they were committed with genocidal intent. With respect, that's not what this court said in the Bosnia and in the Croatia cases. The real test, and the court has repeated it on several occasions, is not that genocidal intent be a possible inference. Let me use the language of provisional measures. It's not that genocidal intent should be a plausible inference. The court has said it is necessary, quote, that this is the only inference that could reasonably be drawn from the acts in question. Addressing the counterclaim in Croatia versus Serbia, the court said that for a pattern of conduct, that is to say a consistent series of acts carried out over a specific period of time, to be accepted as evidence of genocidal intent, I've highlighted the words of the, up on the screen, it would have to be such that it could only point to the existence of such intent, that is to say, that it can only reasonably be understood as reflecting intent. In declaring that genocidal intent must be the only inference that can reasonably be drawn from the acts in question, this court has brought great clarity to the law. Instead of focusing on whether genocidal intent is plausible, it looks in it looks in the other direction. Is there another explanation? There's an enormous amount of unproductive speculation 
it's often prefaced with phrases like, if certain things were proven, it might even be genocide. And indeed, given the prevalence in the world of today of racial and religious discrimination, of apartheid-like policies, and of persecution of ethnic minorities, indigenous peoples, migrant workers, and refugees, in many countries and conflicts, there is, no shortage, there is no shortage of acts that may fit within the paragraphs of Article 2 of the Convention and about which it can be said, if certain things were established, this might genocide. By insisting that genocidal intent, if based on a pattern of conduct, be the only reasonable inference, the court has developed an effective, realistic, and workable approach to the Genocide Convention. Regrettably, there are too many commentators, political figures, and campaigners who either misunderstand the court's approach or prefer to ignore it. They cherry-pick paragraphs out of its two great judgments, yet fail to grasp the most fundamental principle, where genocidal intent is premised on a pattern of conduct, it must be the only inference that could reasonably be drawn from the acts in question. This is as essential to the provisional measures stage as it is to any eventual determination of the merits. In the context of a provisional measures application based upon Article 9 of the Genocide Convention, the test must be whether it is plausible that genocidal intent is the only inference that can be drawn. In other words, unless it is plausible that another reasonable explanation of the intent for the acts can be excluded, the application must fail. That's a very different test to the one proposed by the applicant, which is whether genocidal intent is one plausible explanation. The applicant, as well as the fact-finding mission upon which the application relies, fail entirely to address the issue of alternative explanations for the intent element. And yet all they had to do was to read your Bosnia and Croatia decisions in order to know that this was required. The genocidal intent is often described with the terms specific intent or dolus specialis. We find pronouncements about the specific intent, sometimes the formulation is special intent, in the earliest judgments based upon the provisions of the Genocide Convention, going right back to the Eichmann case, the two judgments of the tribunals in Israel, and the judgment of the trial chamber of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in Akayesu. In fact, the term specific intent, or dola specific, was employed in domestic criminal law long before international criminal law had even come into existence. In ordinary criminal law, as a general rule, crimes of specific intent also contain or are underlain by offenses that do not require the specific intent. For example, the crime of planned and premeditated murder generally contains a kind of included offense of intentional murder and negligent homicide or manslaughter, where the assessment of intent is based upon inferences drawn from a pattern of conduct rather than upon direct evidence of planning and premeditation, a person will never be convicted of planned and premeditated murder if there is an alternative, exp alternative explanation for that person's mental element. And this is nothing more than the reflection in ordinary criminal law of the approach that this court has taken with respect to genocide. Myanmar submits that the information in the application and in the materials invoked in its support essentially the reports of the fact-finding mission, provide ample evidence to indicate alternative, alternative explanations for the alleged conduct other than it is the product of genocidal intent. Should the court agree that, agree that there is ample support for an alternative explanation, then it cannot but conclude that the application has no reasonable chance of success. Not a 50% chance. Not a 25% chance, no chance. 
If there's a reasonable alternative explanation for the intent behind the alleged acts, then the application simply cannot succeed. And if it cannot succeed, it is not plausible for the purposes of a request for provisional measures. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, in both the Bosnia and Croatia cases, the court was assisted immensely by the work of the two ad hoc tribunals. Although more limited, there is some activity at the International Criminal Court that may be of help here to the International Court of Justice. It manifests the drawing of an alternative inference other than genocidal intent for the alleged conduct of Myanmar. In April 2018, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court applied to a pretrial chamber for a form of advisory opinion as to whether she might be able to exercise jurisdiction over the crime against humanity of deportation given the huge cross-border flows from Myanmar into Bangladesh in 2017. Her application, as well as all of the subsequent proceedings in this matter before the International Criminal Court, relied very heavily on the same materials that the Gambia invokes in this case, principally the reports by the fact-finding mission. It is worth recalling that previous judgments of the court in genocide cases have taken into account the activities of the prosecutors of international criminal tribunals. In her application, the prosecutor said that, and I quote, and it's on the screen, the Rohingya people were specifically and intentionally deported into Bangladesh. And she referred to, and I quote, the initiation on 25 August 2017 of a clearance operation aimed at deporting all remaining Rohingya across the border to Bangladesh. She expressly distinguished the situation from, quote, a mass exodus of civilians from one state caused, for instance, by an ongoing armed conflict without evidence of deportation per se. In other words, in her view, the intent of the so-called clearance operation was deportation from Myanmar, not physical destruction. And it cannot have been otherwise, Mr. President, Your Excellencies, because the Rome Statute requires that crimes be committed with intent and knowledge. And crimes against humanity must constitute an attack directed against any civilian population that takes place, that takes place pursuant to or in furtherance of a state or organizational policy. In proceeding with prosecutions for deportation, for the crime against humanity of deportation, the prosecutor is confirming her own view that the massive flows of persons to Bangladesh were not only intended by those who are responsible, but that they are also pursuant to or in furtherance of a state or organizational policy. Let me make it clear that in discussing the work of the International Criminal Court, both the prosecutor and the pretrial chamber, I intend no admission or acknowledgement. But to the extent that this serious and authoritative body provides an alternative explanation, the genocide hypothesis necessarily fails. Only a few days after the application in the present case was filed, a pretrial chamber of the International Criminal Court authorized the prosecutor to proceed with an investigation. Referring specifically to the crime against humanity of deportation, the pretrial chamber concluded that, and I quote, a reasonable prosecutor could believe that coercive acts towards the Rohingya forced them to flee to Bangladesh, which may amount to the crime against humanity of deportation. The pretrial chamber was confirming that an alternative inference for the massive population flows in late 2017 is deportation, carried out with the intent to deport and pursuant to a state or organizational policy. Now this court has confirmed that the forced displacement of a population, even if proved, would not in itself constitute the actus reus of genocide. And here I cite a sentence from Croatia versus Serbia 
on the screen. In the Bosnia case, the court held that, and I quote, neither the intent as a matter of policy to render an area ethnically homogeneous, nor the operations that may be carried out to implement such policy can as such be designated as genocide. The deportation of the members of a group, even if affected by force, is not necessarily equivalent to destruction of that group. The court clearly distinguished between the necessary specific intent, dolus specialis, that is to say, with a view to the, destruction, view to the destruction of the group, as distinct from its removal from the region. And this is a quote from the judgment. The references will appear in court. Addressing Serbia's counterclaim in the Croatia judgment, the court said that, and I quote, even if it were proved that it was the intention of the Croatian authorities to bring about the forced displacement of the Serb population of the Kraina, such displacement would only be capable of constituting the actus reus of genocide if it was calculated to bring about the physical destruction. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, let me now turn to the materials advanced by the applicant in support of the claim that there is genocidal intent. In paragraph five of the application, the applicant explains that, and I quote, facts are extensively documented by independent efforts undertaken under the auspices of the United Nations and corroborated by international human rights organizations and other credible sources. This paragraph in the application will be discussed, but bearing in mind, of course, practice direction 11. In paragraph six, the application turns to the question of genocidal intent. Paragraph six, paragraph six of the application begins with the following claim. Multiple UN investigations have underscored the genocidal intent of these crimes. And what follows are references to three sources, which I will discuss in turn. The first is to the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Myanmar, Ms. Yang Hee Lee. The application explains that she, quote, carried out extensive fact-finding, close quote, and in a report to the Human Rights Council in March 2018 stated, quote, I am becoming more convinced that the crimes committed bear the hallmarks of genocide. The application also cites a news item from Reuters in January 2019, where she is quoted saying that the commander-in-chief of Myanmar's military and other responsible individuals should be held accountable for genocide, for genocide in Rakhine. The news report also said that her interview, quote, marked the first time Lee has publicly called to be prosecuted for genocide, close quote. She never made such statements in any of her reports to the United Nations. Crimes against humanity and war crimes. In her 2019 report to the Human Rights Council, she didn't even use the word genocide at all. And when she spoke to the Third Committee of the General Assembly in October of this year, the only reference she made to genocide was observing that the Gambia was considering commencing proceedings before the International Court of Justice. In all of her writings, the Special Rapporteur provides no explanation for her employment of the phrase hallmarks of genocide. She offers nothing whatsoever to suggest that she understands the legal issues relating to its use or that she appreciates the paramount significance of genocidal intent. Ms. Lee is a developmental psychologist, not an international lawyer. When the applicant says in paragraph six that multiple UN investigations have underscored the genocidal intent of these crimes, describing the remarks of the special rapporteur, I submit, should not be taken into account by this court. They do not underscore the genocidal intent. They read, they refer to genocide, not genocidal intent, and they constitute an opinion 
whose rationale is not explained, nothing more. The second example of genocidal intent is a statement in March 2018 by the UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide. Speaking of the intent, he says it was, quote, possibly, possibly even to destroy the Rohingya as such, which, if proven, would constitute the crime of genocide. A year later, he issued a statement concerning Myanmar that spoke of, quote, conduct that could possibly amount to the crime of genocide. I draw your attention to Mr. Dieng's cautious use of the word possibly. In other statements on Rakhine State, Mr. Dieng used the formulation atrocity crimes and not genocide. It may not be without relevance to the issue of a risk of genocide in the future that, and according to his website, the special, report, the special advisor has not made any statement about Rakhine State or Myanmar for 15 months. During that period, according to the website, he has issued statements about South Sudan, Cambodia, Guatemala, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Mali, Sri Lanka, Syria, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but not, apparently, Myanmar. Location considerably overstates the importance and significance of what Mr. Dieng has said. The special advisor plays a fundamental role in the genocide, role in the genocide prevention activities of the United Nations. His function is early warning, not pronouncements on whether or not genocide has I think he would himself object to being cited as authority for the existence of genocidal intent. The application also did not mention the other UN bodies that have concerned themselves with the situation in Rakhine State over the past two years. For example, shortly after the events of August, September 2017, the High Commissioner for Human Rights described them as, quote, a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. Some months later, he started using the term genocide, but again, with the caution and equivocation that we've already seen with the other mandate holders. There are many other examples, some of them quite recent. The resolution on Myanmar adopted by the Human Rights Council in September 2019 refers to, quote, the need for an urgent criminal investigation into alleged crimes against humanity and war crimes. It doesn't, men it doesn't mention genocide. Nowhere is the word genocide used in the Human Rights Council resolution. Similarly, a resolution on Myanmar adopted by the Third Committee only a few weeks ago makes no reference to genocide. And in July of this year, the Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights reported on Myanmar Rights Council without reference to genocide. The most substantial discussion of genocidal intent, of course, and the one on which the application largely relies, is that of the fact-finding mission. It launched the genocide claim in its September 2018 report. The mission concluded, without equivocation, that crimes against humanity and war crimes had been committed. On genocide, it was somewhat more circumspect. It said that there was, quote, sufficient information to warrant the investigation and prosecution of senior officials in the Tatmadaw chain of command so that a competent court can determine their liability for genocide in relation to the situation in Rakhine State. The mission briefly explains what it means by reasonable grounds in the introductory part of its long report. But it also adds the following caveat. This standard of proof is lower than that required in criminal proceedings. There is a summary discussion of the intent issue in the 440-page supplement to the mission's 2018 report. It devotes 113 words in a 440-page su uh, supplement to considering whether the intent may have been, and I quote, to displace the Rohingya population but not to seek its ultimate destruction. 113 words. And this is the very hypothesis on which the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has based her activities. 
The mission does a little bit of textual sleight of hand by referring to, and I quote from the report, the physical destruction of Rohingya life as it once was, a formulation that ever so slightly blurs an important distinction between physical and cultural genocide, one to which this court has previously attached considerable significance. Elsewhere, in words that are cited in the application, the fact-finding mission states, quote, the crimes in Rakhine state and the manner in which they were perpetrated are similar in nature, gravity, and scope to those that have allowed genocidal intent to be established in other contexts. But they don't provide any reference or examples to what those other contexts are. The mission might just as well have said the opposite. Because in other contexts, similar in so many respects to the circumstances in Myanmar, this court and the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia have concluded that genocidal intent was not established. The fact-finding mission essentially ignores this dimension. With respect, it is campaigning for a case rather than assessing a situation in an objective and impartial manner and it is indifferent as to factors that tend to prove the contrary. That said, the fact-finding mission is not entirely consistent on the subject of intent. For example, when it discusses what it calls a policy of food starvation, the mission says that such, quote, targeted actions to deny access to food appear to constitute a policy of forcing Rohingya to flee through food deprivation. The mission says that starvation is intended to force Rohingya to flee. That is not the same thing and does not necessarily point to physical destruction. Yesterday, counsel for the Gambia suggested a genocidal intent with respect to food deprivation without even addressing this alternative explanation which is proposed by the fact-finding mission. Other statements in the fact-finding mission report also point to an intent other than one to destroy. It speaks in the report of the four, so-called four cuts counterinsurgency policy, which has allegedly been practiced since the 1960s. And the policy, and I quote from the report, this policy has been implemented through clearance operations, essentially scorched earth campaigns in which large numbers of civilians are killed and entire villages destroyed, leading to mass displacement, says the report. But nobody is seriously alleging that there has been a policy driven by genocidal intent underway since the 1960s. Did something change? Why is a clearance operation in 2017 different from one in previous decades? And this question is not addressed. Council for the applicant has attached significance to a statement by the fact-finding mission in its more recent report of this issued a few months ago in September that genocidal intent has strengthened. There were several references to this yesterday. Council did not tell us why the mission reached such a conclusion. And I can explain why council didn't mention it. Because the mission didn't mention it. It appears that the only thing that appears to have strengthened is the insistence of the mission on using the term. There's no real evidence of any aggravation of the situation described in the report of the previous year, rather the contrary. If anything, the absence of allegations of significant numbers of killings in the second report ought to suggest the contrary to what the mission conclu concludes. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, the fact-finding missions of the United Nations, one of them, play a hugely important role in the protection and promotion of human rights. The same can be said of the Special Rapporteurs and the Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide. These comments are not meant to denigrate their work, but only to show how very limited their contribution, contribution can be to the issues that are before this court especially when they go beyond their mandate of genuine fact-finding and 
on the elements of international crimes. The fact-finding mission's mandate from the Human Rights Council was, quote, to establish the facts and circumstances, close quote, not to make legal findings. It's determination, it's determination. Couched in phrases like, quote, reasonable grounds, quote, and sufficient information, when the issue is genocidal intent, cannot be of help here. The opinion of the fact-finding mission about genocidal intent is undermined by its failure to consider in any substantive manner the issue of alternative explanations. Although the fact-finding mission's reports may contain valuable factual information, it is suggested that its legal determination should simply be disregarded by the court because of its flawed approach. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, without the three sources invoked by the applicant as authority for the existence of genocidal intent, the application is devoid of any support for the existence of genocidal intent, beyond the implication that the court infer the existence of genocidal intent from a pattern of conduct, an approach that it has rejected more than once. This is familiar territory for the court because it's not different in any meaningful way from what it heard from counsel during the Bosnia and the Croatia cases. There are some other striking omissions in the application. Nowhere does the application specify the number of deaths, the total number of deaths, and compare this with the size of the population that was allegedly attacked and that crossed the border into Bangladesh. Of course, the application attaches considerable importance to the quantitative aspect, to numbers, because on several occasions, the court is told how many buildings were destroyed. The court is also informed of the number of villages that were destroyed totally or partially. And yesterday, counsel for the applicant told us of many hundreds of deaths in three villages, totaling a little more than 1,000. It tried to present this as a kind of representative, representative sample, explaining that there was one village taken from each of the three townships. But in fact, these were three of the four worst cases described in the fact-finding mission report. But no total is pro proposed, either in the application or in yesterday's submissions. Perhaps this is the first court proceeding anywhere involving the Genocide Convention where the total number of victims was not volunteered by the applicant. Information on this point can be found in the lengthy annex to the report of the fact-finding mission, where we are told that there were an estimated 10,000 deaths, with 725,000 refugees who fled to Bangladesh and 600,000 who remained in Myanmar. The application by the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court also alleges the killing of up to 10,000 Rohingya and, and I quote, the deportation of over 700 Rohingya into Bangladesh. <coughs> Is it possible, Mr. President, Your Excellencies, that the applicant neglected to provide the court with allegations and evidence of the estimated total number of deaths because it sees this as weakening its claim that the entire Yet nowhere does it point to any evidence of mass graves. Whatever the number, every death is tragic. Families have been devastated, and killing non-combatants in an armed conflict may violate the right to life. But 10,000 deaths out of a population of well over one million 
might suggest something other than an intent to physically destroy the group. This inconvenient fact is not addressed by the fact-finding mission. I can already hear the objections from counsel for the applicant, who will explain that genocide is not just about the numbers. But here is what this court had to say in Croatia versus Serbia four years ago. The court considers that it is also relevant to compare the size of the targeted part of the protected group with the number of Croat victims in order to determine whether the JNA and Serb forces availed themselves of opportunities to destroy that part of the group. In this connection, and the words are on the screen, Croatia put forward a figure of 12,500 Croat deaths, which is contested by Serbia. The court notes that, even assuming that this figure is correct, an issue on which it will make no ruling, no ruling, the number of victims alleged by Croatia is small in relation to the size of the targeted part of the group. The court concluded that, quote, Croatia has not established that the only reasonable inference that can be drawn from the pattern of conduct it relied upon was the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, the Croat group. Mr. President, members of the court, any reasonable consideration of the situation in Myanmar? If it is guided by the case law of this court, we'll ask whether 10,000 deaths out of a population of well over a million raises the same doubts as it did for this court in the Croatia case. Now, numbers are important in other respects. The fact-finding mission referred to the 600,000 Rohingya who stayed behind. It said in the detailed findings to the 2019 report, the more recent one, and I quote, the mission found that movement restrictions applied to the Rohingya in a discriminatory and arbitrary manner touch almost every aspect of the lives of the 600,000 Rohingya remaining in Rakhine state, affecting basic economic, social, and cultural rights, including their ability to sustain themselves, obtain an education, seek medical assistance, or even pray and congregate. This is a claim of human rights violations, of persecution, but not of destruction. Had there been a genocidal plan afoot, one would expect a more sinister fate. I think the same can be said of those allegedly confined to displacement camps, reportedly numbering well over 100,000, who have been in the camps for seven years. And the mission, the fact-finding mission, said that, quote, insecurity levels in camps are high and many displaced persons have a sense of despair for the future. It said that the adverse conditions in these camps, quote, in extreme cases led to preventable deaths, close quote. A comment that stands out because the report does not seem to contain any claim of intentional killing in the camps. The mission never attempts to explain why there appears to be no evidence of systematic physical destruction in the displacement camps, perhaps because the reasonable explanation that runs counter to the genocidal intent hypothesis. The similarities with the situation in Myanmar as alleged in the application and the findings of the court in Croatia versus Serbia are striking in other respects. In Croatia, the court found that, quote, in the present case, as emerges in particular from the findings of the ICTY, TY, forced displacement was the instrument of a policy aimed at establishing an ethnically homogeneous Serb state. In that context, the expulsion of the Croats was brought about by the creation of a coercive atmosphere generated by the commission of acts, including some that come actus reus of genocide within the meaning of Article 2, paragraphs A and B of the convention. These acts had an objective, namely the forced displacement of the Croats, which did not entail their physical destruction. 
and the final words are on the screen, the court finds that the acts committed by the JNA and Serb forces essentially had the effect of making the Croat population flee the territories concerned. It was not a question of systematically destroying that population, but of forcing it to leave the areas controlled by these armed forces. To conclude, Mr. President, Your Excellencies, the application fails utterly to address the essential issue of the specific intent to perpetrate genocide. As the court has said repeatedly in its recent case law, where proof of genocidal intent depends upon inferences drawn from a pattern of conduct, other explanations for the mental element of the crime must be excluded. The application and the oral submissions by counsel do not even speak to this essential point. For that reason alone, the request for provisional measures should be rejected. Mr. Presidency, Mr. President, Your Excellencies, that concludes my uh, observations. I would ask Mr. President if you would be kind enough to give the floor to my colleague, Mr. Staker, although perhaps it's the right moment to take a break. I thank Professor Shebas for his statement. Before I give the floor to the next speaker, the court will observe a coffee break of 10 minutes. The sitting is adjourned. Welcome back, as uh, you are for watching the proceedings there live from The Hague in the Netherlands. Uh, on the uh, defense side of Mayamba, on the, the genocide allegations that have been, of course, um, said to have happened in the country, in Mayamba, of course, they are defending their case. Yesterday, we had, uh, of course, Gambia's uh, case, and then, uh, interestingly, today, of course, these men are led by uh, their leader, of course, and um, yeah, interestingly, it, it looks like it's going to be a long defense so far, almost um, an hour or so, uh, you know, two of them have, have spoken so far. What, what's your understanding, basically, um, on what they have put forward? Absolutely. It will, it will be a very long debate, and then, you know, this is a court or a legal battle, mm -hmm. and in any legal battle, more issues are bound to come out, because it is allegation, counter-allegation, and then process or efforts by the one accusing to defend. Mm -hmm. And the defendant actually will do all effort to counter. It is a legal debate mm -hmm. and in such a debate that, you know, it doesn't end unless and until the jury is able to hit the button on the table. Mm -hmm. And what we are beginning to see is actually the uh, Myanmar coming up with a counter, yeah. you know, I mean, counter to the presentation oh. of Gambia. Yeah. And the submissions have been very powerful. Yeah, indeed. So how long will this continue? Mm -hmm. This is, you know, a process mm -hmm. by the International Court of Justice yeah. to um, decide. Mm -hmm. But actually, it also sent a signal that there is no one <coughs> at any point in time who should make any conclusion or attempt to conclude yeah. that the case is going to end in either way. Yeah, interesting one. And um, like you said, we understand, you know, uh, the proceedings, of course, would take long because, uh, by, you know, before uh, we'll get to the time when, you know, a final verdict would be uh, would, would be done that would take mm -hmm. ages. But of course, there are some demands that, you know, Gambia and other countries are, are demanding protection of the Rohingyas and others. But uh, so far, of course, upon what you heard from the different side. Well, what's your own reading? What is your understanding? Of course, like Prince have said, uh, it might be difficult to, to, for anyone to, to draw any sort of a con conclusion as, as of now uh, on where are we heading to probably here against tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very difficult one. Um, and the defendant also did make very powerful submissions there yeah. because they um, counter almost all the points yeah, the Gandhian, the, yeah, reference to, to you know, what things, actually yeah. happened to their own country and the like. And also, um, the, yesterday, the Gambia's Justice Minister, Abu Bakr Tambiru, did say that, you know, 
uh, actually, uh, Myanmar really failed in preventing this uh, uh, genocidal acts. But what we are saying here that the um, Suki is coming on board saying that, you know, before actually the international community coming on board, they should have allowed internal, you know, accountability to take place. But they did not allow the internal accountability to take place. Now they are interfering in their internal stuff, which in you know which is um, jeopardizing their internal accountability so you know these things are but one thing is actually very very clear which he also did mention is that you know nobody denies that there is actually killing mm -hmm. happening you know this genocidal act nobody is is denying that it is there because it's so many people the 70,000 approximately 70,000 have fled to yeah. Bangladesh and also um, 24,000 are reported to have been killed uh, in this in this process which which um, clearly defines genocidal um, uh, genocide yeah. but um, they actually made very powerful submissions and of course they also did mention that you know how their military actually were victimized by by others and also in their own country which she claimed that has not been brought you know uh, to in the, in the, in, in the ICJ and they have not been um, tackling it um, you know uh, professionally or they have not been really putting efforts to making sure that they have give justice to his own people so you know these are all submissions that he she made out there and also this one coming on board saying that it is not admissible uh, admissible because you know what the gambia is saying all the evidence that the gambia is basing is actually from the un fact finding mission yes, exactly. you know and given so many counter narrations in that in in that regard saying that but you know we all know that the gambia's justice minister is has been to rohingya yeah. and he saw actually and yesterday bangladesh yeah well. bangladesh of course the refugees, themselves. The refugees and the victims themselves and what he said that was you know uh, he see fear fear um despair and des um, despair and desperation in the faces of these victims so actually um you know to some extent he got the the evidence from the un fact finding mission but he also has been there and he saw actually what really happened there and even the international everybody you know saw it there but also one thing that she said that got us is that you know most of in her defense is most of the evidence or submission by the gambia is based on the images and all that and the other one also defender did also um, mention that actually yesterday um he did not he was not able to give the actual figure of yeah. the people who yeah. have been killed yeah, that have victimized, you know, yes yeah. that have been victimized so you know all these things are counter narrations and you know it's going to be really really difficult but so far the case is very interesting the both the uh, prosecution witness and the defendant have very given very good points out there so let us just see and what will be the outcome of this well, these are court matters, very sensitive issues, uh, very systematic um, ways of responding to mm -hmm. issues as well. And then that's what we're apparently seeing right now mm -hmm. from the defense uh, defense team of uh, Miami. Uh, well, Press, uh, of course, uh, just to tell you, it's, 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 it's a 10 minute break. We know we are, gonna, yeah. we are not going to stay long. Of course, we will be going back to the to the Hague anytime soon uh, to further continue following the proceedings and of course hear from the uh, defense team of mm -hmm. Miami. Then, uh, two of them have spoken so far, and of course we expect more. Uh, just um, you know, after the break, are we? Do, do you feel that we are going to uh, continue such uh, to see such long, uh, such kind of defense, you know, from from Neymar? Because they are trying to bring um, you know, arguments and, and systematically to deny all that have been um, levied against against them. Yeah, at this point in time, it is very imperative for mm -hmm. also every viewer to watch the image of Un San Su in yeah. this case. Yeah. She herself has been a victim of human rights, I mean, violation. Right. She has been held in house arrest for ages. Yeah, by the, for by the calling. Yeah, by yeah, the yeah. military, yeah. she is today defending. Defend. Yeah. And this military has been accused of committing genocide, yeah. human rights violation by different UN agencies. Absolutely. So the whole world has been watching this in the news. But today for her to come in defense of a military, and the police that also victimized her one time ago, I think this is a cause to raise eyeball. What she's saying is that Gambia is relying on misleading pictures. Mm -hmm. So which pictures is she referring to? Mm -hmm. If the news has published, for example, that genocide is taking place, you know, human rights violations are taking place. So today it is the case for them to justify. 
And if you look at the legal backing, you know, from their submission, yeah. you will realize that they are talking about the, in fact, the jurisdiction aspect of it, that um, Gambia does not, or the court does not rely yeah. or should not rely on the submission of Gambia mm -hmm. uh, because the court has two main risk, um, I mean, I mean, obligations yeah. or roles mm -hmm. to play in this situation. First is to settle dispute brought before the court by states. The other role that the court play also is to issue advice, mm -hmm. legal advice to parties. So on this stage, it is not going to be even what whoever loses the case, it's not like the court is going to conduct arrest or do e bidding. Exactly. But it's just, like, just yeah, it's a question you know? of image. Mm -hmm. So here, the image is at stake. Mm -hmm. And the Rohingya, I mean the Myanmar, yeah, yeah. has to do everything possible to definitely defend the image of the country and the leader mm -hmm. who, yeah. has, exactly. who, who herself definitely is a Nobel Peace Prize holder mm -hmm. as we speak. Mm -hmm. So this is the question of image at the moment. Interestingly, and, and just to uh, you know go back quickly uh, on uh, what uh, Gambia submissions was yesterday, and according to uh, the Gambia submissions to the ICJ, the military stands accused of widespread and systematic clearance mm. uh, operations against the Rohingya mm. beginning in October 2016 and expanding in August 2017. Now, the Gambia's petition alleges that the clearance were intended to destroy the Rohingyas as a group in whole or in part uh, via mass murder, rape, and uh, setting fire on their buildings, often wi with inhabitants and locked inside. So these are the kind of things that, you know, were said to have happened in, 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 in Myanmar on, 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 the, on the Rohingyas. And with all that have been said, mm -hmm. now we are, you know, upon hearing from the different side, uh, they're trying to, you know, deny everything and say, no, this is not the thing that um, actually happened. happened or as you were saying. Mm -hmm. And um, talking about also the military and arrest that you mentioned. So interestingly, these things are not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Sue or this military are not going to be arrested as whatever yeah. might have been uh, might have come out from from this yeah. procedure. Mm -hmm. Two issues emerge from the submission of um, the leader mm -hmm. Unsan Su today because he said the actual um, incident in reference today definitely happened you know in a crossfire. Mm -hmm. The Muslims might have been victims due to circumstance, but they were not the primary target. Okay. So if you look at Professor Shabbat's um, submission, it's the fact that genocide has to be justified by the intention. But from all the submission that the Gambia placed before the court, according to him, um, does not suggest or prove that um, the e events or the accident or the attacks were intentional. Mm -hmm. So maybe the Muslims, Rohingya Muslim here in this situation, you know, we are victim due to the circumstance, but not definitely the main target. So this, for 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 these re reasons, they are saying that the court should disregard the submission, and this is very important because uh, at the end of the day, um, somebody mm -hmm. like Un San Su, for example, mm -hmm. okay. what has she done? Because people are not only reprimanded or punished mm -hmm. for what they have done but you are also punished for what you have not done, yeah. an obligation you omit. We understand, yeah, there are court martials going on, but these are issues that happened since 2000, it began beginning, end of 2016, yeah. for example, the case in question. Mm -hmm. So how would the Myanmar authorities quick would have maybe convinced the world that the issues of genocide mm -hmm. were condemned and they have done enough to end it? before somebody from outside, like a state like Gambia, would come and place it before the International Court of Justice. All right. Uh, very well. Of course, I know, as, as we are uh, discussing uh, the proceedings, um, you know, people around the globe are also equally watching, especially on the social media, and uh, they have been, um, you know, making or giving, uh, making comments on, on perhaps as they watch on the proceedings at Hague. And I believe, uh, Julda, we have some uh, comments there with you. You can tell us what, what people have been saying with regards to but they have been also um, yes since, since um, this comment is actually from Basonko mm -hmm. uh, he is saying that you are routine criminals in denial like the criminal Myanmar government killing innocent Rohingyas if these things aren't true why did thousands flee to Bangladesh living in camps we are all we have all seen the videos um, 
this one is also um, saying that Arsa Arakan, he is saying that fake professor speak 2017 genocide on uh, Rohingya by Al, Al, Al Jazeera report, but today change professor by Myanmar terrorist government money. Uh, he's actually saying that the um, the genocide that happened there, uh, which the terrorists involved in. Uh, Zamandi, he is also saying that we're suffering more than 50 years longer. What is humanity or human beings? We are proud, I'm proud for being a Gambian people. Um, I'm proud of um, Gambian people. I have met, I have, oh, I don't know what he was trying to say, but I think he wants to say that I have uh, met so many guys from the Gambia. They are really nice people. Thanks, Gambia, a lot. Uh, yes, yeah, that is what yeah, he really wanted to say. Interesting. Looks like people all the way from Myanmar. Uh, we Myanmar, are all course, commenting uh, on social uh, media. Uh, uh, all, all, all following. And, yeah. Uh, I know they'll, I mean, be, they'll be very much. Coming. The social media is loaded with comments. So, so many comments. Uh, this one is um, Yusuf Kebe. He is saying that you are welcome, brother. This is how you should stand for your fellow Muslims. Uh, he's also looking at it in the Muslim context. Uh, yeah. Yeah, if you look so, at um, basically the public discourse, you are, you, the public discourse has been there yeah. forever, and this is just a sign of continuation. Mm -hmm. And you know the issue, the word genocide, wherever it is laid on the country, this is a question of image. And you know, before the World War mm -hmm. Two, we have seen like the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. We have also known about the American domestic yeah. um, genocide. So this word to be attached to places like after the World War, the we, I mean. Rwanda, you're talking about the Darfur, mm -hmm. and now Myanmar. Myanmar. So the world is watching. This is going to be a very interesting case, mm -hmm. and whether they can defend it or they will lose the case, this is the question that we are yeah. here to watch. Yeah. Please be seated. The sitting is resuming. I will now give the floor to Mr. Staker. You have the floor. 